I'm Chris Winslet. Um, the talk is why Postgres. Um, I work on the. I work at Crunchy Data. Uh, that's the company right there that I work for. Um, previously, I was at a company called Compose. Uh, we ran uh, databases and data centers all over the world. So databases as a service. It was acquired by IBM in 2015. So, I, long story short, I've been running databases and clouds for about 15 years now. So we started when you probably shouldn't have been running them on AWS, we were running them on AWS. And so um, we're actually gonna talk about you know, some, of that, some of that history in a moment. Um, so also, I was a high school teacher right out of undergrad. So if you just have any questions, just shout them out. Um, I'm more, I enjoy the uh, audience energy coming out of this much more than just kind of rambling through a conversation. Uh, that's why I kind of ask a couple of you what you what you want to get out of this, just kind of understand and kind of tailor some of that content, uh, some of the information. Um, so being a high school teacher, power can go out, like, you know, anything can happen. We're going to get through this. The, um, so you can see my email address down here. That's my Twitter account. My Twitter account's my ramblings at 3 a.m. Um, so not much Postgres content there. But you can check out our blog on Crunchy Data, and we have some out, outstanding Postgres there. Um, so why, why Postgres? Um, a lot of other databases uh, want to talk about what Postgres does not do well. They want to talk about what Postgres is deficient at. They want to talk about what Postgres is slow at. There's a lot of companies that make money because um, th they talk about what Postgres cannot do. So what I'm here to do is I want to be an advocate for Postgres. And I want you to come away from this being an advocate for Postgres. I would like to have people who sell Postgres, sell open source Postgres, the same way people, um, the same way people, uh, you know, sell these other databases, right? I mean, the the way people come out convicted for it. So what I'm going to talk about is a lot of the features, some of the functionality, uh, some of where we've been, some of where it's going. Um, so how many people in here know that Postgres 15 went GA two weeks ago? We've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, there was seven. Excellent. So I would say those people are probably on the cutting edge, right? Like those people know about Postgres, know some of the functionality that came out here. So um, I am here to recruit you into being a advocate for open source Postgres. Uh, ground rules of this is that I'm not going to trash other databases, right? So I'm gonna speak, I'm gonna just speak positively about Postgres and kind of talk about some of the other things that it does. So if you ask me specifically about a Postgres, about a different database, I'll tell you all the things that it does well, and then I'll also tell you how Postgres also does that well. Um, so I'm glad you're here. Um, let's get started. So um, as I was planning for this, um, how many people in here know Kelsey Hightower? Excellent. He's, he's amazing, right? He's kind of the godfather of Kubernetes. He, um, he was part of the core OS team that was bought by Google that eventually became Kubernetes. Um, he put this tweet out there. And he just said, uh, if you were starting a new software project from scratch, would you, cho would you use a proprietary database? Um, if so, which one and why not? And I thought, wow, that's interesting. I want to see the responses. Um, and so about an hour and a half later, he had to come out and make a caveat because everyone's got their own opinion about databases, right? Like databases like spark something in us that is like we want to personify that database and to do the things that we think is valuable, right? That we think that we need to have. So a short time later, Kelsey came out and said, I'm making assumptions that you understand the database requirements. The question is an attempt to understand how much weight you put on a database being open source. Of course, no one answered the question and everyone just came out and said which database they would use, right? Like, so some people came out and said, well, various different things. Um, so. In response to that, um, I just kind of watched around. And I was like, okay, let me see which ones kind of resonate, right? Um, and this is the one that, that resonated with me. Uh, Kelsey always so responded to it, saying this is a great answer rooted in pragmatism. Um, so it really depends on the use case, but, but most general purpose way to start today is Postgres. Actually make it a point to put the query stuff behind a layer and minimize large joins. So he's like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna use Postgres in a pretty simple way, kind of ease our way into it when we start using it. And then he says, then, if you, can swap, then you can swap if needed, no need to over-optimize. Over um, and Kelsey said, this is a great answer in rooted in pragmatism. And this is probably not what you expected 
when you came to a why Postgres, but the answer is because it's easy to migrate away from. Now, there's a caveat to that is, I don't think you're going to move away from it as quickly as you think you will move away from it. But the data's there, right? Like, you can, you can access data in a particular way, you can export it, you can pair it up with other open source databases. Even with open source Postgres, you're not vendor locked in. Uh, if you go to a Postgres compatible database, it may not do the things you expect it to do. Some of the functions may be different. So open source Postgres gives you the most amount of flexibility. Um, that's, why, that's why it's rooted in pragmatism, because it's easy to migrate away from. Um, so, and then to kind of, I didn't know who the audience was going to be in this talk. I didn't know if it was going to be people that are database experts, people that are junior people. I was talking with one of, my, um, one of my coworkers and I said, you know, what I'd really love would be a room full of people who have only been developing for about three years, have never interacted with a SQL database before, and think SQL cannot do things, right? Think SQL's old, thinks Postgres old. It's like, that's my ideal audience, right? That's who I want to come to this because I feel like those are the people I'd like to advocate to, right? They're the people that are getting touched by the marketing. They're the people that are getting touched by particular companies, but that's what I wanted. So, but in talking with a lot of you, a lot of you are much more experienced with this than, uh, than some of the younger, or some of the uh, junior folks. So, what is Postgres? Postgres is a standards compliant open source database that uses SQL as communication, and it, there's about 30 years of improvements associated with it. It has powered Web 1, Web 2, Web 3, and will now, now power Web 5, right? That's, that's the next one. That was an attempt at humor, but. <laughs> okay. Um, so the number one issue that most people have heard, most junior folks uh, new to it, is uh, Postgres does not scale, right? Um, they've heard relational doesn't scale. I'm here to say it scales, right? It scales. Um, so let's, uh, is, it, is it a rumor, is it fact, like what are we, what are we looking at? So let's kind of rewind back to when this kind of became a rumor, right? Uh, this was probably 2000, so 2006, mid 2000s or so, kind of after the first dot com bust. Um, there were different kind of applications being built. People were still SSHing into machines. Uh, people were building cloud based point systems for just about everything, right? So these cloud based SaaS systems would, um, they were centralized. Previously, the deployment model was you would deploy behind firewalls. In 2006 to 2008, you start getting a lot more of these centralized SaaS systems. That brings data into one place under management on the cloud. Um, also, we were starting to get in, getting things like Twitter and Facebook were starting to get a little bit bigger. Um, they weren't as huge as they are now. They also weren't as mature as they are now. They were down routinely. Um, and so you had a lot of this kind of centralized data kind of growing up at the same time. Um, and then what happened was you also had cloud companies that were also growing up at the same time. You had Amazon that had just started around 2004 or so and really became a, like, a way to run your cloud databases around 2008. So w what was happening then, so when you say Postgres doesn't scale, like you kind of had this kind of storm, right? You had these market conditions of people needed this new functionality out of a database. You also had, we have these new deployment methods that aren't necessarily, haven't necessarily grown yet and haven't necessarily become capable. And so what you had was kind of this, un, like this bad situation where it's just like, okay, we've got to find a way to scale this. Um, so that's where NoSQL kind of came about, uh, NoSQL kind of growth kind of came about. Um, the maximum, so a core part of databases is hard drive performance, right? Like how quickly can I read from the hard drive? Uh, IOPS, so internal uh, input output per second. Um, how quickly can you read? How quickly can you write per second? How many of those operations can you do? Um, at the time in 2008, the maximum IOPS was uh, about 100, okay? So that's 100 input output operations per second on a magnetic drive on top of EBS. And that was highly variable. You could get a situation where you may have 40. You could get a situation where you may have 80. You get a situation peak, peak was 100. Uh, to compare that to where we are today, today on AW, AWS, you can get around 240,000 IOPS. And so 
that changes the game. Like, and let me show you how it kind of changes the game. Let's, uh, let's hop in a cloud machine and go back in time a little bit. So let's see. All right. So we've got this. Oh, one. Okay, so we got this. Excellent. Okay, we're going to SSH into this machine here. Okay. So this is the machine. So I didn't even know AWS still had magnetic drives until I went to go provision this for this particular scenario. And I was giddy with excitement because it's like, why would anyone use these things anymore? <laughs> okay, so we've, we've gotten into this thing. Um, let, me, let me bring up something else as well so that we kind of see the performance, right? Um, okay, so what this is is just a small, I think it's got two gigs of RAM. Um, it's got 100 IOPS. Um, what else? It's got, a, it's got a one core. One core, and I only want to do one core. Um, but actually, no, I think it does have, no, it has one core. Anyhow, it's not an overpowered machine, right? Like something super, super simple. So now what we're going to do is we're going to use this tool called PG Bench. Um, PG Bench is a good tool for just kind of stressing something. Um, so let's see. Uh, let's see. Um, so it's just a good tool for stressing a database. Um, we're going to watch down here. We have, oh, sorry, one. So we're going to watch performance down here on the bottom. Uh, so it's 100% idle, no IO weight. That's just kind of the machine that's running, right? And so uh, we're going to run this PG bench. So it's going to do updates, it's going to do writes, and it's going to do inserts. So it's uh, pretty, you know, pretty active on that database, right? Um, so it's running here. So instantly, what do we see, right? We see IO weight jump up to near 100% pretty much instantly. So what you had in like 2008, time frame through at least 2014 was that you're running these databases on severely constrained hard drives, like severely constrained hard drives. And so that's where the doesn't scale come from, right? And to kind of give you a, um, and to give you perspective, this is an $8 machine, like $8 per month. It's not, I mean, it's nothing big. So, okay. So let's zoom forward. So this is 2008. Let's zoom forward to 2014. Okay, so let's SSH to this new machine. Okay, here we go, SSH. All right, so we're in this machine now, SSH down here. We're gonna do the same thing with the, the, the SAR. The readout won't be near as nice, but we'll be able to see a little bit of it. Let's run that same PG bench command that I have. Okay. So I'll run that on there. Let's go up here and put that in. Okay, cool, excellent. Let's do PG bench. Oh. Okay, here we go. Excellent. Let's run that. Okay, so this is six concurrent requests, uh, six, six jobs running. Oh, I'm running it twice. I'm double hammering it. One second, it's R1, okay, excellent. Let's see what's happening on the hard drive now. Okay, so now we've bumped it down to 72% um, to utilization. So taking it just from 100% down to 70% is pretty drastic. Um, that particular machine there is also $8 per month, and that is with a uh, 100 IOPS. So so that's like, that just goes from like the variable magnetic disk IOPS up to the, up to the like, you know, steady state, we have 100 IOPS, right? Um, what's funny is you take that next down the line to what we have today with the excessively capable IOPS and you get all this stuff and it runs incredibly fast today, right? Like super fast, super performant. Um, I've got one more machine. Let's see, am I kind of running out of time doing this example? Let me make sure it's not. Anyhow, the premise is Postgres scales. <laughs> okay. Um, and then the last thing, let's see. All right, let's do this with one more machine just to test it, just to get it going. Okay. Uh, here we go. Where is my cursor? Here it is. Okay, excellent. So SSH. Okay, excellent. And then let's do SSH. Okay. 
Okay, and then we're gonna do star one down here. Excellent, okay, cool. Okay, that one is nice and idle. And then we're going to do, let's do our same uh, test here. Let's do our same PG bench test here. Okay. Okay, um, excellent. Excellent, okay, so now we're running. Um, You'll see the utilization kind of bounces around there. That's just because we're actually getting better performance. Okay, so transactions per second on this $8 machine on the first one from 2008. So right here, we're looking around 86 transactions per second. And that's a multi, that's a variable workload. So you have a multi-use workload where you're doing writes, updates, and, and uh, inserts. On the second one, that's with uh, slightly more. That's with just consistent IOPS. And then with the one on the far right, what we're looking at is uh, 3,000 IOPS. And what's so funny about these machines is all of them cost $8 per month, right? So long story short, make sure you pick the right machine whenever you launch your, <laughs> whenever you launch your database um, that you get performance. Um, that one was supposed to be much faster. I don't know what's wrong with my presentation, but that one, um, okay, anyhow. That's where we are. So the, what's happened is the one on the far left is gonna be resource constrained by the hard drive. And the ones in the middle and the right are resource constrained based on the uh, CPU capabilities and the switching cost and the scheduling processes. So what, we're, what, we're, what I'm getting at is the, the scale from 2008, like Postgres scales. Is there any questions about this? Okay. Excellent. Okay. Now, um, the next thing about why Postgres is not only does it scale, it helps you scale. Um, the number one variability on performance for any database is how you use the database. So how the database is being used by your application. So what queries are being sent to it? Um, what indexes you have? Do you have enough indexes? Do you have too many indexes? like how all that stuff works. So um, the, uh, pr you, you can actually be, you can actually bring any database to a halt by, um, by using it incorrectly. That goes for, you know, NoSQL databases if you try to use them like relational databases or, um, you know, just any database you can grind to a halt with certain commands. So perhaps a good talk for the next presentation would be how to grind any database to a halt. Um, so a good, like any good database, any mature database is going to have the tools necessary for you to find out how to improve performance of that database. Um, so Postgres has those tools, right? Postgres has those tools for a while. Um, the majority of ways with any database that you go about improving performance is you find that one query that is being abusive to your database you go fix that one query, and then you go look how your performance is improved, right? Because what happens is once you free up the, the resources from that one abusive query, then you have a brand new abusive query that you get to go fix, right? And so how do you find those, right? Um, so Postgres gives you the tools to find these, these queries and to continue the process of optimizing your database. Um, so Postgres scales, Postgres helps you scale. Um, there is logmin duration statement. Uh, that's just a simple setting. You should have that as part of your configuration file. Basically, this is just like a, um, it's just something that you just kind of want to run if you ever have like a query that takes more than 45 seconds or maybe a query that takes more than 30 seconds. Just something that's kind of a gut check that you can go back and check your logs, right? Um, so that is, that's just kind of a good, a good uh, base. Um, and then you've got, um, actually, let me show you how this works because um, that was kind of the point of the presentation. Let's see. Okay, so logman duration. So let's uh, take a look back at these. Let's shut this down to just get down to one machine. Okay, excellent. Okay, so now we're down to one machine with Postgres. We're actually gonna tail, tail the log. Okay, excellent, so that's a, oh, it looks like our duration is already running. Excellent, 
So I've already set that configuration on this particular database. The, um, but what you do is just go to Postgres. Um, all right, here we go. Now this is the configuration file. Um, anyone who um, really wants to dive into the internals of Postgres, um, the configuration file is a great place to start. Um, but we're going to start with log min duration. Okay. So as you can see, this log min duration right here is set to 10. So that means 10 milliseconds. Anytime we have anything that runs more than 10 milliseconds, we're going to dump that to a logs, just so we can kind of come back to it when we need to do a health check or something like that. Any questions about that? Okay. Here's how to take log min duration to the next level. PG auto explain. So PG auto explain takes log duration to the next level. So log duration just shows you the query that's slow, right? What auto explain is going to do is going to show you the, um, it's going to show you the uh, query, um, the execution plan that happened as part of that particular query. So whenever, whenever you get a, a query that runs particularly slowly, um, it's going to say, okay, let's dump the execution plan alongside that into the logs that did you come back and say, okay, let me see how that ran at that particular time. So let's take a look at this. All right. Um, okay. Do we have auto explain in here yet? No. We're going to go to um, shared preload. Okay, so we already have PG stat statements in there. That's foreshadowing. Okay, auto explain, excellent. And then we're gonna go to the bottom and set one more setting, auto explain dot, um, what is it, uh, log min duration equal 10. Okay, uh oh, I gotta do that with sudo. We're still in 2008, so I have to run sudo. Okay, uh, one second. Auto explain. No. Do I? No, I don't. Yes. I, I don't think I need a comment. We'll, we'll see. Let's roll the dice on this one. <laughs> Auto explain. Okay. Auto explain dot min duration. Uh, log min duration. Okay. Equal 10. Excellent. Okay, let's restart this the way we did it in 2008. Restart. Oh, we gotta do it with sudo again. Okay, here we go. So Postgres restarted. Uh, it came down, could not start server. Oh, you're right. Gotta have a comma there. One second. Uh, auto explain. Okay, here we go. Let's go back to start. Okay, ready to accept connections. Okay, so um, no one manages databases like this anymore. Um, this, is, this is the way we did things back in the day. Like Kubernetes is the way now, automatic deployment, Ansible scripts, that kind of thing. Um, this is just for fun. Okay, so, we, so let me run a pretty, uh, let's see, JMA do test. Let me run a, a query here that um, is particularly uh, bad. Okay, we, we're running on something without an index. And so when, when this query completes, what we should see is a uh, command down at the bottom that shows the explain how, the, uh, how this particular part, uh, how this particular query ran. So where this is important, right? So you're capturing your logs from your database, right? That, that's probably going to be a key tenet of any particular database as a service system. If you're running a database internally, if you're using a database service, you're going to be able to capture your logs. Um, capturing logs is important to be able to go back in time and kind of say, oh, this happened at this time, this spike happened right here with my application, let me go look and see what my database was doing at that time, and then you can identify particular, uh, particular actions. So what we have here is um, the duration, so the duration was 31, point, uh, 31 and a half seconds, and um, this was the query that ran, this was where the cost, so we did have two parallel workers on it trying to um, run through this particular sequential scan of PG bench account. So it basically just walked through all the, um, all the rows to try to find it. So what that tells you, once you kind of get to learn to read these, once you kind of understand, that tells you you need to create an index on that particular, uh, that particular column, right? 
Any questions about this? Okay, cool. So now we're still in the Postgres helps you scale, right? So we have Postgres scales, Postgres helps you scale. So the, the next big thing is going to be PG stat statements. So PG stat statements kind of takes it to the next level. Um, we were talking about dumping it to logs um, and that you can analyze after the fact. Um, now it's with PG stat statements, you can actually keep slow queries, your slowest queries in your database so that you can query that um, from some type of UI, like an admin UI or something like that. So we have already loaded the PG stat statements in this. We saw that a second ago. Okay, let's see, start Postgres. Okay, I'm going to close this bottom area because we don't need logs anymore. Excellent. Okay, very cool. Excellent. So we're there. And then we're going to come over here. We have PG stat statements running. Um, is it already loaded? Uh, oh, and it got to be su I got to be super user. Uh, so dash u Postgres plus QL. And then we want to do Jamie test. Oh, that is not the right database. Okay, so now we're in there. We can do create extension. Now we created extension. So we loaded PG stat statements into this particular database. So now any query that runs after this will be logged into this PG stat statements with its performance so you can come back and do analysis on it. Um, this is particularly interesting. There's a really old repo on GitHub that makes this interaction really nice. It's called uh, PG Hero. Uh, PG Hero kind of has some queries that are built into it, give you a GUI that allows you to kind of dive through some of these particular tables. Also, there's some other functionality out there that, um, that does that. Um, and good, good providers bake that into their services and cloud services as well. I'm not going to say which ones, but the good ones do. Okay. Uh, let's see. Do we have anything in there yet? Let me look. It should already be loaded, right? Okay, here we go. Okay, excellent. So, oh, so these are the top five rows that are abusive, right? So it's like, which queries do I need to fix? Well, these particular queries are the ones that are, um, that are using the most average execution time. They're being called the most. It's on the total ro rows. So we have a couple of updates there. Then we have a couple of select statements. It's like, okay, let's go and check out those particular ones to see if you know, see if they're the ones that are actually being abusive to the database and how we can improve it. So Postgres has the tools necessary. There's a lot of, t so what I've shown you here are the tools that are baked into these database deployments. It's a lot of the, um, the code, the back end. There are a lot of other tools that make this really, really nice out there. Um, I know there's a couple of monitoring tools that you can actually hook onto your uh, Postgres database that will actually tell you which queries are your slow queries, where the, um, you know, what you need to perform, that kind of stuff. Um, it's, yeah, there, there's some good ones out there. What's, what's that one, uh, PG Analyze? P, is it PG Analyze? Yeah, PG Analyze uh, by, what's his name, uh, Robert? Yeah, Lucas, Lucas, yes, yeah. Yeah, that's, it, it's really good. So, anyhow. The, what I want to say is like there's tools in the ecosystem, there's tools baked into Postgres. If you're running Postgres and you get to the point where you're like, uh, how can I scale this next? Use these tools, right? There's tools that are available. Uh, be willing to get in there and kind of uh, pick around. Okay. Okay. Um, so why Postgres, uh, modern compliant SQL and transactions? Um, a, I didn't know what the audience was going to be in here, right? I didn't know if we were going to have junior developers who had never interacted with SQL before. SQL feels like, uh, SQL's kind of sold as like this older technology. And, and the truth is, it's pretty amazing. Like you can, you can slice and dice sets with it. Um, so let's, let's kind of unwind some of the things that some of us more experienced people have and take away some of the things that we take for granted. You know, take away some of the union calls, take away some of the group buys, take away some of this thing that we take for granted because it just works. And let's think about how we would sell SQL to somebody who has never encountered SQL before, right? Um, and 
initially I talked about I want you guys to be advocates and I want people to be advocates for Postgres. Part of being advocates for Postgres is being advocates for SQL. So imagine you've never heard of SQL. Imagine we only run document databases. Imagine everything is just that kind of world, right? Like, how would you describe SQL? And kind of the thing that I came up with is SQL is a programming language that gives you tools for filtering, joining, aggregating, and re-representing normalized data. Um, that may not sound great to young people, but I think that sounds fantastic. Uh, <laughs> or to, to junior developers, but I think that sounds fantastic. So um, also for, for people who are in this, in this kind of like junior phase, like SQL is a contact sport, right? Learning SQL is a contact sport. It's not something that you can learn by reading about it. It's something that you have to learn by actually interacting with it, by running some queries, by potentially blowing up a host because you didn't have an index on a particular query, right? So there's these things you have to learn. And then the tools that I talked about a moment ago for those things that say, um, those tools I talked about a moment ago for, uh, for, for pointing you in the right way to scale, that's, um, those are tools that, some, that people need to kind of learn, need to have access to. So if you're kind of keeping your developers away from the, the slow queries, it's like you actually just need to send your slow queries straight to your developers, right? Like, let them, let them get that, that understanding of what actually, what's actually happening. So um, same way, like some of the best ways to learn SQL, contact sport, uh, you, like look and see what your ORMs are doing. It's gonna take a long time. I would say for me to become proficient in SQL probably took me about six years. And then that's going from like developer to you know running databases to really doing a lot more analytics. And then I would say, pro I mean, I would tell you I even learned commands in the past, I don't know, commands in the past few months since I've been working at Crunchy Data as well. So it's kind of like everyone kind of has their toolbox in SQL and they go back to that toolbox and then it's cool when you interact with other people in the SQL world and they have a different toolbox and then you learn about that, their toolbox and you're like, wow, that's awesome. I didn't know I could do that. So or I've never thought about reconstructing my data in that way. So that's kind of, um, that's it. So now is a good time to pitch our playground. So at Crunchy Data recently, uh, for those who want to learn SQL, uh, recently at Crunchy Data, we launched uh, Postgres Playground. That's where you can run, we run Postgres in the browser. We actually have tutorials beside it. So we have uh, a tutorial on the left side. We have Postgres running on the right side. You don't have to bootstrap your Postgres or anything. It's just running right there in your browser. It's a great way. I, I even enjoyed doing some of the tutorials, and I've been doing SQL a long time. Uh, some of my coworkers wrote some interesting tutorials for things that I don't necessarily work with a lot of the times. And so it's good to kind of be exposed to that particular part of it. Um, any questions so far? Cool, cool, excellent. Okay, so why Postgres, uh, number four? It's a strongly typed database. Um, I feel like, I feel like we've kind of done this thing where we went like dynamic typing for a little while and now we've kind of circled back and now we're doing strong typing again, right? So as a, um, as a programming, as an entire open source community, um, we've kind of, we've said, oh, you know, the, the way you actually scale these teams, the way you actually scale teams is through, um, is through strong typing. Don't, don't surprise someone with the type of something when it shows up. Um, like, give them something to rely on. Um, your data is part of that, right? Like, when you get data back, you expect it to have a particular type. Um, so let's kind of look at, uh, let's kind of bust out into some SQL and see what I mean by this. Okay. So we got this, um, let's see. Okay, we still have our Postgres running there. Okay, we still have this. Let me make this a little bit bigger so we can see it. Okay, cool, excellent. So I'm just gonna do some dead simple select statements just to kind of show you what typing looks like. Um, so we're gonna do, do uh, let's say, does select one equal A? Okay, select one. Uh, what have I done? Oh, oh, it gave me curly brackets. Okay, my copy and paste failed me. <laughs> right. Okay, here we go. Okay, so select one equals A. That fails. Postgres does not like that. Invalid syndex for type integer A. Okay, uh, let's say does A equal A. So select 
a equal a. Yes. Uh, yep, that's true. Okay. Um, let's do a select one and then cast it as text equal a. No. Oh, uh, no. oh I did one. Yes. Oh, yes. There we go. Okay. Does that equal a? No, it does not, right? Okay. What about if we cast a as an integer? Okay, what happens on this? My Q one. Type the wrong thing. Okay, here we go. Okay, A. No operator matches the given name and argument types. Okay, so operator does not exist. Integer equal text. Um, oh, that's not what I want to do. I want to cast A as an integer. Okay, cast A as an integer. There we go. Okay, invalid input syntax for type integer A. So here in Postgres, what I've done is I've recasted, I've recast some of those, uh, those particular uh, values into different types, or I've attempted to recast. Um, do you know what happens if you do this in, in JavaScript? Like, it hates life, right? Um, yeah, so um, but that's not a slam against JavaScript. Like, TypeScript's fantastic. OK. Um, Excellent. So also with Postgres, what's interesting about being strongly typed is you can go create your own data types. Um, if you check out create domain, you can create your own data types around particular data types. One particular one that gets, uh, that gets used pretty often that's in the community that's available in Postgres is just a money data type. Um, as you can imagine, when you're talking about money and you're talking about floats, um, you want to make sure that you get the money calculations correct. And so um, using that money data type in Postgres is, uh, is essential for whenever you're doing calculation um, and subtraction, dividing and stuff. Okay, any questions about strongly typed database? Excellent. How close am I on time? Anybody? Oh God, I got, okay, we gotta go. All right, so uh, yearly releases. So why Postgres yearly releases? So, this has been pretty, ama pretty amazing by Postgres. Um, over the past, uh, since, 20, uh, since 2017, uh, when Postgres 10 was launched, so, you know, everything was trying to figure out how they were doing versioning. Then Postgres went uh, 9.0, 9.1, 9. .1, 9 .1. They were doing this kind of uh, uh, development version and then, um, and then production version. And so then they got up to 9.6 as a production version. And then in 2016, they said, we're just going to whole number versions, right? And so they just started doing 10, 11, 12, and 13. So that was in 2017. Uh, since 2017, um, it's, been, it's been amazing that Postgres, as core contributors, as community, has launched a new GA release uh, every September or October. So the fact that we just saw Postgres 15 launch two years ago, it, or two weeks ago, is not just a happenstance. It's not just because it was fortuitous, right? Like they, they're strategically launching, they, they've decided to launch at regular yearly intervals in this way and, and achieve that, right? So it's, a, um, it's pretty awesome. So to, and to, to connect that to with what we were talking about a second ago with the rumor Postgres doesn't scale, if you look at Postgres from what was available in, in the times that we were kind of talking about 10 years ago up to the Postgres that's available today, it has changed incredibly. It's powered so many, th so many changes in the environment. It's powered us the ability to launch on Kubernetes. It's powered the ability to, um, to run uh, just uh, multi-parallel queries. It's, it's powered a lot, of, um, a lot of performance and deployment capabilities. So it's, it's awesome. I'm excited about that. So if anyone asks why Postgres, say, let me tell you how often they release. It's awesome. Okay. Um, the next thing is documentation. The documentation for Postgres is fantastic. Um, if you go read the most recent release of Postgres 15, it will talk about all the features that came out. One that came out was sort improvement. Um, if you go read about that sort improvement, um, you it it's not a it's not if you understand, like if you, you kind of just kind of grok some of the index, grok some of the way things work within databases, it's a very good read and you can read it quite quickly. Um, the rest of the documentation on functions, on how, how functionality works. Uh, let's even look at the JSON data type uh, as an example. Let's see. So, uh, come on. Okay, so where are we? OK, 
Okay. Excellent. So this is how good Postgres documentation is. Um, this is the JSON data type. So um, the it tells you how JSON works. It tells you how some of the uh, how some of the different tool sets work within JSON. Um, when you get down into here, it actually gives you code that you can copy and paste into your uh, PSQL uh, into your terminal and get responses back. It's like it's it's just a really good walkthrough. Like the the documentation for Postgres is world class. Um, most of the time, so the, the caveats that you need to know about the Postgres documentation, there's a version selector here at the top. So you can say, what version am I on? And you go back to the particular version you're on. Um, and so if you're, a lot of the times when you're searching on Google, what'll happen is Google may take you to like version 12 or something. And then what you wanna do is you wanna be like, well, I'm on version 14 actually. So you change to version 14. Um, so Postgres documentation is fantastic. It's really easy to explore. Um, all right, what's next? Okay, okay. Uh, why Postgres, libraries, tools, ORMs? Uh, every, every programming language, every modern programming language, every old programming la language has a way to connect to, um, has a way to connect to Postgres. I mentioned some of the community library, or some of the community tools that are out there for, for uh, helping you optimize your Postgres. And then ORMs are fantastic. I don't care what, so. This may be another conversation. I enjoy using an ORM when I'm doing basic CRUD. When it comes to reports, I get out of the ORM. Let's go back to SQL. Um, and truth be told, like I've actually learned a lot of SQL because I went and saw what the ORM was doing and fixed it. So that's a good way to learn SQL. Okay. Uh, why Postgres extensions? Um, you can turn Postgres into a world-class GIS, a geographic information system that um, will allow you to map the world. Um, it's, it's like magic to me. It's above my pay grade, but Paul Ramsey is fantastic on, it, on our team. Um, and then why Postgres? It runs in the cloud. It runs on Kubernetes. It runs on Prim. It runs on Windows. It runs with Ansible. And now with a recent playground, it runs in the browser, so you can go play with it in the browser. OK. The, um, so this was actually my favorite response. Um, to uh, to uh, um, the tweet from Kelsey Hightower. It's like, why Postgres slaps the top of a Postgres server? This bad boy can fit so many use cases. Excellent. Uh, thank you all. Anyone have any questions? Cool. Uh, we've got some extra coloring uh, activity books. Uh, if you want one of those, come see me. If you want to chat about anything, come see me. If you want to dispute anything I said, come see me. Uh, thank y'all. Cheers.